blessing. Um, this world don't know what love is, but I'm thankful for the Word of God today where we can look into it and we can see what true love is. And we can see, if you ever want to know what love is, just look to the cross and you'll see it. And uh, amen. Don't forget about Wednesday night Bible study. We'll be here at 7 o'clock and uh, looking forward to a good time in the Lord's house, uh, a little bit of time of prayer around the altar, and then uh, we'll get into our Bible study out of 1 Peter. We'll be in uh, 1 Peter 2 again, uh, looking at some more verses on uh, on Wednesday, so you don't want to miss that. Uh, don't forget about um, um, July the, let's see, July the 2nd, next Sunday night. Don't forget about that. Brother Heath Reese will be preaching uh, for us. So he'll be here that night. And uh, some of the folks from uh, Pleasant Valley Baptist Church, I'm sure, will join in. And uh, we'll have a good time here. Y'all pray for me. I'll be down at Southside Baptist Church in Yakinville preaching that night for Brother uh, Ryan Hayes. And so uh, I desire you prayers next Sunday night. And uh, But come on and uh, get in. And I promise you'll have a good time here with Brother Heath. And uh, he's a blessing. I love him, and uh, I know that uh, I know that he'll give you the word next Sunday night. So don't miss that. Uh, don't miss. Uh, don't forget about July the thirtieth, fifth Sunday fellowship. We're gonna. Uh, do some things a little bit different, mix things up that day, but the, the best thing, the biggest thing is we're going to eat, so uh, make sure you figure out what you want to bring. We'll have a good time of fellowship after the morning service, and uh, just have a good day in the house of the Lord. That'll be July the 30th. All right, make sure when you leave this evening, stop by the table on your way out, grab some tracks, invite cards, and pass them out uh, this week as you're out and about in uh, in town. Invite people to church, and more importantly, give them the gospel. And so uh, uh, I know the Lord will bless you for that. Take your Bibles tonight. Find the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter number 2, and uh, we'll see what the Lord's got for us here tonight. We've been uh, preaching through the book of 1 John on Sunday nights for several weeks now, and uh, we've been taking this theme of fellowship that is in the book of 1 John and just kind of dissecting it and looking at what the Bible is teaching us. And so tonight we've made our way to uh, 1 John chapter number 2 uh, and verse number 12. We're going to read a few verses here, uh, but we've looked at the uh, the beginning of fellowship or the foundation of fellowship. We've looked at... Um, Oh my goodness, I can't even remember. We've, we've looked at the proof of fellowship, how a Christian ought to be, what are some things in their life that uh, you're going to find. I know we live in a world that says judge not, and they take the rest of the passage in Romans chapter 7 or Matthew chapter 7 and, and just uh, uh, cut it all out. But, uh, uh, you know, the Bible does say that you can know a, fruit, uh, a tree by the fruit that it bears. And uh, the Bible tells us what a Christian ought to look like. It tells us what a Christian ought to act like. And so we looked at that um, uh, uh, last week, I believe, and then, um, uh, no, it wasn't last week, it was the week before, and then last week we looked at another set of uh, verses there in, in, in uh, verse number 7 down through verse number 11 here in chapter 2, and I can't remember what I called that, but it was all about love. That's interesting, that's what we taught on, or what we preached on this morning, but, and some of what you, what we looked at this morning, you're going to hear tonight because it all goes together, you know, it's an amazing thing, the Bible, you know it. Uh, there's some themes in the Bible that just repeat themselves. You know why they repeat themselves? Because it's very important. You know how we learn something? We repeat. Uh, we repeat. How are you going to learn something? It's repetition. God knows that. He, he created us. And so uh, we're given those in Scripture. So if you found your place, let's stand in honor and reverence to the reading of the Word of God. We'll read uh, three verses here in 1 John chapter number 2, verse number 12. The Bible says here, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Thank you for standing. You can be seated tonight. Now, as we enter into this passage in 1 John chapter 2, I'd like to say life is full of growing. 
Is it not? Life is full of growing, and when we're born, we begin growing, do we not? Uh, we learn many things in our first five years. We learn how to walk. We learn how to talk. We learn how to behave. We learn how to dress ourselves, or most of us do at least. Um, I know some adults don't know how to do some of that, but oh me, anyways. Uh, some people never learn how to behave, do they? And uh, oh my. Well, anyways, we learn how to clean ourselves, or we should. Amen. I know. I know that don't work on a lot of people either. And uh, hey, I go out in public. I know how it is. Uh, anyways, but uh, we're supposed. I guess I should say we are supposed to learn how to clean after ourselves or how to keep ourselves clean. We we are supposed to learn how to take care of ourselves, aren't we? And uh, we do that. Uh, I mean, from those first five years after birth are pretty amazing at all that takes place. And, and they're here and gone like a flash. Uh, but one thing's for sure, we grow. And uh, we grow. Now, uh, these are the formative years where a child will learn to be the person he or she is going to be. And yes, I said he or she because there aren't anything else. Anyways, uh, I know that's not popular, but he or she, that's what, yes, anyways. And uh, we learn how to treat others. We learn how to be treated. And uh, the learning doesn't stop there now. From five to six years old, and the child goes to school, and for the next 12 years, they'll be learning and growing. After school, many will go to college, and some will go to work. And at college, the professors will stretch the students and challenge them uh, to learn and be responsible. At work, the boss will uh, give the man or woman job responsibilities as they perform their jobs and, and begin to grow in their knowledge and production. Then uh, they, at times, will get raises or job promotions. Uh, here's my point. We're always growing. Doesn't matter what you're doing, you're always learning, you're always growing, you're always going from one step to the next. Life is full of growing. And the Christian life is no different whatsoever. It's no different whatsoever. The entrance into fellowship is not a stopping place. It's a starting place. Oh, we've got this misconception. Oh, preacher, I got saved, I'm happy now, I'm good. Well, that, that, you just began. You did. That, that's, the, that's the jumping off place. That's the starting point. And, and so I, I want you to understand that growing and growing spiritually is a theme all throughout Scripture. As a matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1 says this, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Now, uh, that word perfection, it's not talking about being perfect as we see it. It's talking about maturity. It's talking about maturity. Let me ask you a question, and don't answer it out loud. Give yourself the answer in your head. Are you a growing Christian? Are you a growing Christian? I didn't ask you if you are a Christian. I asked, are you a growing Christian? See, that, that's, a, that's another good question to ask. It's just like when you knock on somebody's door, you're talking to somebody out on the road somewhere. I don't ask people if they're saved. I ask them how their relationship with Jesus is. That always stumps them. Because uh, if you ask if somebody's saved, everybody around here is saved. And so uh, I want you to understand, are you a growing Christian? Are you moving toward maturity? And by the way, this has nothing to do with your physical age. It has nothing at all to do with a physical age. You can, but I want you to understand you can only be young once, but you can be immature a long, long time. Is that not right? This is like what we see today. We see, hey, the grow, growing happens physically, whether you like it or not. Uh, whether I liked it or not, my little girl is, is, is no longer the little baby that, that I used to hold in my arms. My son is no longer the little baby I used to hold in my arms. Why? Because they're alive and they grow. Well, here's the thing. We've got a lot of people that have grown physically, but they're immature. 
And honey, you could be 88 years old today and be immature. Has nothing to do with physical age. Well, that's kind of the same idea that I'm talking spiritually about tonight. And uh, the problem in many of our churches is well, we've got people that have been born, but they've ceased to grow. Tonight's message on the thought of fellowship is the growing of fellowship. This is an important subject because fellowship in church comes about when we grow. And in 1 John 2, 12 through 14, here are these verses tonight. Uh, John mentions three categories of persons. He mentions children, young men, and fathers. And when he's, what he's talking about here is growing into maturity. And uh, it's talking about coming from childhood to fatherhood. And uh, you might wonder, what are the marks of spiritual maturity? Well, let me tell you, it's, it's not necessarily your spiritual health or your spiritual gifts. We are talking about going on to maturity. And what is maturity? Well, maturity is Christ-likeness. Um, as a matter of fact, Ephesians 4.13 puts it this way, Till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect... Man, once again, there's that word perfect. It's not talking about uh, being sinless, but it's talking about being mature. It says unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What's it talking about? You measure your spiritual maturity by how Christ-like you are. In what, preacher? In everything. When you get mad, when you get glad, when you get sad, whatever it is. You act like Christ. That is the measure of spiritual maturity. Let me tell you something. I, I'll just put it to you this way. I don't measure ministry by the size of a building. I don't measure ministry by the size of the offering. I don't measure ministry by the size of the attendance. I measure ministry by looking at those whom I am teaching and seeing if you're becoming more like Christ. I know that's not very popular everywhere we look. Oh, well, your, your church is being blessed. you got 5,000 people in it. Well, hallelujah. If he gives me 5,000, that's great. That's not how you measure spiritual success, though. You don't measure spiritual success by how many followers you have. You don't measure uh, spiritual success by how nice of a building you have or how big of a building you have. All of those are temporary earthly things. This goes to show you how carnal-minded we are even in the church. It's true. Here's what I'm concerned with. And I love all of those things, by the way. I want this church to be full. I want us to have to build a building. It would be wonderful. It would be wonderful. It would be a wonderful problem to have that we couldn't fit everybody in here. And we couldn't fit all the cars in the parking lot. That would be a wonderful problem. But I want you to understand tonight when I look out, here's how I measure ministry. I measure on whether I see you growing. Well, preacher, I don't know. Well, let me give you a Bible for it. Colossians 1.28. This was the goal of Paul's ministry. He said, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. Why? He didn't say so he could get the biggest crowd. He doesn't say so he could have accolades and have his, have his name and his, his image in the limelight. Here's what he says, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. There's that word perfect again. Mature. What's he talking about? Well, let me just put it this way. I'd rather have a little bitty church with about 20 people whose theology was about a mile deep than have a football stadium full of shallow little children. I'm not talking about real children, by the way. I love children. But see, here's the thing. You can fill a football stadium on shallow theology. When you start getting into the Word, when you start getting into the doctrines, when you start getting into teaching Christ, and I'm just telling you, I, I, I'll just, let me just put it this way. I'd rather have ten on fire and serious about serving God than a hundred that's just fooling around. 
Why? Well, same reason Paul said what he did, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So let's take a look at the classifications of maturity given in these verses. It's a good study. Number one, let's look at little children. The first verse, verse number 12, says this. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Boy, I like that. Children in this verse literally means born ones. It comes from a verb meaning to birth or to bring into existence. This is a term of endearment describing what? All of God's people. We're all God's little children, so to speak. That's what it's telling us. And if you've been born again, guess what? You are a child of God. John addresses here every single one of the believers in Christ. When we are saved, we are born again. And guess what? When we're born again, we're babes. Just like in a physical birth. We're babes in Christ. No one is born into the family of God fully mature. Just as it is in the physical realm, no baby is born into this world mature. And this is where we begin. We begin as babes, little children. It's obvious that John is writing to believers here. I like what Guy King wrote uh, in his commentary. He said, that is true of every real believer of whatever age, the oldest or the youngest in God's family. We are indeed never in the family unless or until that has happened. Oh, the bliss of it that what we have done as sinners is forgiven for the sake of what he has done as the Savior. That's so what it says. Did you catch that? I write unto you little children. Why are we little children. Why is he talking about? He says, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Aren't you glad? I'll, I'll read that again. He said, what we have done as sinners is forgiven for the sake of what he has done as the Savior. Hey, Christians can say tonight that all is well with their souls because why? Their sins are forgiven. John reminds the people of God here that their sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Whose name? Well, Acts chapter 4 verse 12 tells us whose name's sake. The Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given given among men whereby we must be saved. What name is it? It's the precious, holy, blessed name of Jesus Christ. We call on the name of Jesus as Lord, and it is for Jesus' sake that God has forgiven all our sins. And so we see these little children right off the bat here, and that's what uh, this is talking about. But the second term we find is in verse 13. We see fathers. Look at what it says. I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. Now look on down, skip into verse 14, and he says it again. I have written unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. He is saying it twice right here. And so here's what we've got. We've got the first level of maturity, which is little children. It's where we all start. We're born again. We're little babes in Christ. But then he tells us about fathers. Now, he addresses another level of spiritual maturity here. And John moves from talking to the saved to talking to the sanctified. He writes unto fathers in this portion. Well, who are these fathers? Well, in this context, the term fathers is a reference to, who, to, uh, to, to those who are spiritually mature in Christ. See, the Greek word translated father here has, has a variety of meanings and application. And uh, here's, I thought this was interesting. Uh, one of them here is the meaning that it's a reference to teachers as those whom students traced back the knowledge and training that they had received. And John mentioned twice the knowledge that the fathers had of the Lord. Now these are Christians not only, who not only know the wonderful doctrines of the Bible, but they know the author of the doctrines. And they're out here teaching those doctrines to who? The little children. I ain't talking about Catholics, by the way. Y'all don't get sideways on me over this. I'm just classifications of spiritual maturity. Now, the Christians that have grown to this level of spiritual maturity... They have a deep knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and an intimate relationship with Him. 
And such knowledge and love provokes uh, worship and provokes praise for the Lord. This kind of maturity is what we should all desire in our lives. In fact, Paul put it this way in Philippians 3.10, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. Paul had one goal in life, and that was to know Jesus Christ. Oh, preacher, I don't understand. He was a saved man, wasn't he? What else was there? Well, you're telling on your spiritual maturity level by thinking that. I ain't here to make nobody mad. I'm just trying to help. Paul did know Christ. Paul had established several churches. He was, he was a, uh, I mean, you know, you think of all the work that he had done and everything he had repented of. And uh, yes, at the end of his life, he was still saying that I may know him. He never arrived. There's never a plateau. There's never a time in our lives where we arrive. And so John reminds us here that God wants us to grow in Christ and to mature in the Lord. The problem is, and the problem is, many Christians could care less about growing in the Lord and being like Christ. That's the problem. They could just care less. I mentioned that this morning. <clears throat> talking about love and talking about apathy and the, the epidemic, the cancer that is in our churches, uh, that is apathy, the complete and total antithesis of sympathy. And I, I mentioned, why is there apathy? What is the problem? Well, it's very simply this. We lack love. There's no love. Without love, there'll be no passion. You know why people don't grow as little children in Christ? Because they just don't care. Look at verse 13 again. He says, I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. Look at this. I write unto you little children because you have known the father. Now this is interesting. I was studying this out. And there seems to be a lot of repetition here. And on the part of the fathers, it really is repetition. On the part of the little children, it actually isn't repetition. Uh, the Greek word for little children in verse 13 is different from the one used in verse 12. In verse 13, the Greek word carries the idea of immature ones. You see, in verse 12, it means born ones. In verse 13, it means immature ones. Isn't that interesting? And uh, little children still under the authority of teachers and, teachers and tutors. These are young Christians who have not yet grown up in Christ. Like physical children, these spiritual children, need, they know their father, but they still got some growing up to do. Now, H.A. Ironside, he wrote this. He said, there are many who have been saved a great many years, but are spiritually dwarfed because they give so little attention to spiritual things, because they give so little time to the word of God. They are so little exercised in holy things and know so little of the blessedness of prayer and communion with the Lord, and therefore they do not grow. <coughs> That's the little children in verse 13. Many Christians never grow because they refuse to listen to spiritual instruction. They have the attitude that says, you can't tell me what to do, I'll do it my way. My question is, I'm not even sure if a man with an attitude like that has ever even been saved. Why do I say that? Because if that's his attitude in church, then... <coughs> how did he ever look to an almighty God and say, God, you're right, I'm wrong, I give myself to you. I'm sorry for those sins I've committed. I know you sent your son to... I mean, y'all see what I'm saying? I mentioned that last one. Isn't it amazing? I, I mean, I'm not making this stuff up. 
I'm giving you scripture for all. Isn't it amazing how these themes run through all different verses and scripture in the Bible? This past Wednesday, talking about our response to authority or how Christians should respond to government. There was a theme there, which kind of goes right along with this. If you can't have respect for your fellow man, if you can't submit to authority at the workplace or in the church, how in the world did you ever submit to the authority and lordship of God to be saved? And we see that again here. And, uh, and, and, and so <clears throat> many Christians, yeah, they've got this attitude. You can't tell me what to do. I'm going to do it my way. Many Christians live defeated because they've not grown in their Christian life. Many in the world today that are Christians are just saved and they've never moved on to sanctification. But let me tell you something. Sa salvation is an instantaneous, once and done event that leads you into a life of sanctification, which is a journey. I mean, honestly, there's three steps here. We have salvation, which is once and done at the beginning. You have sanctification, which is a lifelong process. And then one of these days in the future, when we go to heaven, there's going to be a glorification. You ask me, well, preacher, is salvation a once and done thing or is it a, or is it a, a process? My answer is yes. <laughs> That's the way the Bible teaches it. But here's the thing. Well, David Jeremiah, speaking of the fathers in the faith here, he said this. I thought it was pretty good. He said, these have lived the longest, survived the most fights, won the most battles, failed the most, and been forgiven the most. Therefore, their hindsight is invaluable. They can look back and declare to the children and the young men, God has never failed me. God is faithful. That's what the fathers do. And so we've got the little children We've got the born ones, we've got the fathers, and now we even have the immature ones, the little children. And then we also see here, in verse 14, we see the young men. The young men, look at verse 14, it says, I have written unto you young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. What about that classification? John writes unto young men. Who is being referred to right here? Well, the young men is a term referring to believers who have grown and they continue to grow in their comprehension and understanding of Scripture. They have moved beyond the stage of being a baby Christian and they've learned to base their lives on the foundation of God's Word. They look at life through the eyes of Scripture and they're not afraid to stand up for Jesus Christ. They're not afraid of spiritual battles because the Lord has strengthened them. I want you to understand here in a contrast, little children have to be served. But young men, they serve. Young men are in the battle. Young men are warriors. Young men are workers in this scripture here. But you know, many, I, I, just, I have to keep going back to this because it's such an issue. Many in the church are sitting around still being served, though. Amen. They are the immature little children from verse 13. You believe some people even come to church thinking they're doing God a favor? I feel sorry for you if you feel that way. I ain't trying to be ugly. But you coming to church is not doing God a favor. That's what a lot of people are doing. You might be saved tonight, but you're not working. You're not a warrior. You've simply, got, you've simply gotten saved and said, Hallelujah, thank God my sins are forgiven. And you stop when you really ought to move on and go on to the next stage in the spiritual life. You know why? You know why you've got that attitude when you could be a young man fighting a war? You know why? You know what the difference is? 
between somebody that just says, well, hallelujah, I'm saved, I'm going to sit here, as, uh, uh, as uh, Vance Havner used to say, he said, God didn't save us to sit, soak, and sour. He saved us to serve. He saved us to fight. We ought to move on from being little children. We've got people sitting in our churches that's been in church for 30 and 40 and 50 years, and yet they have grown old in church, but yet their maturity level is still that of a little child. Here's the thing. What is the difference between somebody like that and a young man, according to this verse? You want to know why the young men in this verse are strong versus those who are so weak? It's the Word of God. Look in verse 14. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the Word of God abideth in you. That's the key. The word of God didn't abide in them because they were strong. They were strong because the word of God abided in them. When you're strong, let me tell you something, folks. Let me tell you something. Please get some help out of this tonight. When you're strong, you'll stop being a punching bag for the devil and you'll be able to overcome him. That's why it's so important in the Christian life. We've got people today that want to sit around and mope and whine and, and, and have their pity parties because it never seems like the devil lets up on them. Well, guess what? The devil don't let up on any of us. The difference is, if you're a warrior, you ain't got time to sit down and listen to the liar. If you're strong, how do you become strong? You abide in the Word. And what happens when you can abide in the Word and you're strong? Well, look at the end of verse 14. Ye have overcome the wicked one. If I had any message tonight for anybody here, I'd say stop being a punching bag. Get strong. Maybe the reason you're down all the time. Maybe the reason you're out all the time. Maybe the reason you... you I mean... Maybe you just need to get in the Word of God and stop sitting around being a punching bag. Let the Word of God abide in you and overcome the wicked one with it. H.A. Ironside wrote this. He said, It is the Word of God first thing in the morning, the Word of God all day long, and the Word of God the last thing at night. It's talking about abiding in the Word. He says you go to bed with the Word of God in your mind and you will wake up with the Word of God in your mind. It is the Word of God that keeps from the power of the enemy all hours of the day. The Word of God. The Word of God. I know a man, I, I, I was reading a book. It's really helped me out in my Christian life. But uh, he said that... Uh, he said he bought him one of those little light-up signs and put it on his nightstand. He said when he goes to bed at night, it's the last thing he sees. When he wakes up in the morning, it's the first thing he sees. He said, I simply put myself a reminder that said, think about God. Think about Jesus. Talk to God. He said, that simple reminder, when I go to bed, I always seem to go to bed with a verse on my mind. And he said, I always seem to wake up with a verse on my mind. And he said, I'll go through. Hey, let me tell you something. It's not weird that we all get songs in our head. From the time we was little to even today, you can hear a song. That song could get stuck in your mind. You'll go to bed thinking about that song. You may go to Walmart. You may have to go to Walmart the night after church. And while you're in there, you may hear a song that you really like. Now, it might be a song that you don't listen to anymore because you're a child of God. But hey, 20, 30, 40 years ago, you really liked it. It's funny how you can remember every word. Because you put it in your mind at one point in time. So here's the thing, the Word of God works the exact same way. 
You fill your mind with the word of God, and guess what? You'll wake up with a verse on your mind. You'll go to bed with a verse on your mind. You'll go throughout the day. Hey, what am I talking about? I'm talking about abiding in the word. It says, I've written unto you, young men, because you're strong, and the word of God abideth in you. The Bible tells us in the book of Psalms that uh, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I may not sin against thee. Yeah. Are you a growing Christian tonight? Hey, let me tell you something. If you are a child, I thank God that you've been born into the family. I am. But here's my desire. I want you to become a young man. There's a battle. There's some work that needs to be done. There is a battle that, are, that there is to be fought. And here's the thing. Are you a young man? Are you a child? Are you a young man tonight? Are you a worker? Are you a warrior? Well, if you're a young man tonight, and as far as your spiritual maturity, well, praise God for that. But you know what? I want you to become a spiritual father. Amen. I want you to remind others of God. I want you to become a giving person. I want you to become a reproducing person. I want you to be the person who has the knowledge of God. And if somebody has a problem, they can come to you about it. Yeah. Think about it. You think about spiritual father. Spiritual young man. There's all sorts of applications we can make in this passage. I'll tell you one, because I just said it talking about being a father. Little children don't reproduce. And I hope you understand I'm talking spiritual here. Just as physical, children don't reproduce. They've got to reach a stage in life before that happens. We all know that. We all had biology, didn't we? We see the same things in spiritual life. If you're a little child spiritually, you can't ever expect to reproduce. Yeah. Preacher, what are you talking about? I'm talking about being a soul winner. Yeah. I'm talking about being, being able to talk to people about God. Amen. Being able to talk to people about Christ. Being able to lead someone to Christ. You'll never do it if you're a little child. You've got to grow. You've got to be a young man. You've got to be a spiritual father. And by the way, I'm using... Children, young men, father, that's what the Bible... I'm talking to you women just as much as I am the men. We're talking about levels of maturity. And if you're a little child tonight, my desire for you is to become a young man. If you're a young man, praise God, I'm thankful for it, but my desire is for you to become a father. I want you to walk around and people know that you have been so much with God that you begin to act and you begin to look like Him. Well, preacher, I just, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm giving you Bible. How do you, how do you measure spiritual maturity? How Christ-like are you? The first step is birth. Have you been born again? Do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? You know God wants to save you tonight. He wants to forgive your sins and He will do it. But then, that's the first step. You become born again into the family of God. You're a little child. You're a born one. But then if you've never grown tonight, if you've never matured in your Christian life, would you come get that right tonight and begin growing? Would you stop living for yourself? It's perfectly, it is perfectly possible for a Christian, even though they are saved, to just live for themselves. I see it everywhere. I've even seen preachers live for themselves goes back to the message this morning with those those Christians that were in Corinth and they were more concerned about their spiritual gifts and and their their talents that God had given them and they were more concerned with with those gifts putting them in the limelight 
And here comes Paul saying, hold up, y'all. If you ain't got no love, you've got nothing. Have you grown tonight? Have you began growing? Again, it has nothing to do with your physical age. We're talking about spiritual maturity. Let's stand and bow our heads, close our eyes tonight. Would you come lay it all on the altar tonight? If you're not saved, that's your first step. You're not even born into the family of God if you're not saved. But then, just as much as something would be way wrong, a little baby was born physically and never grew, there's something way wrong with a Christian tonight. 